Hello everyone, welcome to Jen Kiray's Focus on webinar for May. Today we're going to be talking about our sample handling external quality assessment schemes and we're going to provide a review of our DNA extraction EQAs and quantification EQA of DNA. So I'm Sandy Deans, I'm the director of GenQA, and I'm delighted to be joined today by my colleague, Fiona Moon, who's one of our senior genetic technologists at GenQA, and Fiona manages the DNA extraction and quantification EQAs for us. So today we're going to focus on um, what GenQA is, a very quick introduction for those of you who don't know us well. Um, Fiona is going to talk about the EQAs for sample handling, that pre-analytical processing stage, the DNA extraction the format, because it is slightly different from some of our disease-based assessments that we perform, um, and the results that we found from the EQA runs. Also, give an idea of and an outline of the DNA quantification EQA, because again, that's quite a unique format, how we run that, and the results that we have been um, collating from the previous runs some overall general observations, the future of sample handling EQAs, and we've got lots of new ideas for the horizon and to bring online in the next few years. And then we'll give you an opportunity to ask us any questions related to the sample handling EQAs through a live Q&A session. So please, as we um, move through the presentation, please insert your questions into the box. Hopefully you can see that on your screen and we'll work our way through the questions there at the Q&A after the presentation. So next slide, please, Emma. So I'm just going to start by giving you a bit of a, an outline of what GenQA is and what we do. So GenQA is a member of the UK NEQAS um, consortium. That's the UK National External Quality Assessment Services. And really the services are about helping to ensure that the clinical lab test result, they're accurate, they're reliable and comparable wherever they are produced. So if a sample is tested, say in Scotland, you would get exactly the same result if a sample was tested in Australia, for example. So UK NEQAS itself is a charity organisation and it's made up of about 25 different specialist centres dotted across the UK in a self-funding, not-profit making scheme organisation. So UK NEQAS has been along, around for a long time, um, over 50 years, providing EQA, predominantly in more in clinical chemistry and haematology disciplines, but obviously genomics is now very much here in laboratory medicine, and we provide the assessments for the genomic services. Despite being called UK NEQAS, we have participants worldwide, and in fact, GenQA has about 80% of participants out with the UK. We're just located here. And we also operate all of the NEQAS schemes are ISO accredited, and that's to ISO um, 17043, which is for EQA and proficiency testing provision. Next slide, please, Emma. So what actually is EQA? Well, the World Health Organization definition is it's defined as a system for objectively checking the laboratory's performance using an external agency or facility. So really it's about to give the laboratory or the clinical service a measurement and a standard way of demonstrating the performance of their service. And it's used by many people. It's used by the laboratory itself, clinical teams to select where their testing will be performed. It's also used by commissioning teams, fund profit um, organisations, and sometimes pharmaceutical clinical trial centres. So it's really important that EQA data is accurate and it's shared in the best possible way for the benefit of the patient. So next slide, please. So GenQA, as I say, um, is a, a relatively new NEQAS scheme um, because of, and I think we can say it's very much um, evolving and expanding going forward. And I think that's just a reflection of how genomics is starting to infiltrate across laboratory medicine. So we have nearly 1,800 participating labs. We um, perform um, 119 EQAs for this year, and we have many of them are pilots. We've got participation from 87 different countries at the moment, and we also operate with um, a huge amount of expert input, and, and we have 260 currently expert assessors who help to advise and moderate and assess the EQAs. If anyone is interested in joining our team, which is fantastic, and we really work with some great people, then please do get in touch with us. 
So this just shows you the range of how um, genomic testing has started to um, come into its forefront in lots of different clinical um, scenarios and different disciplines. So we have our bread and butter EQAs such as cytogenomics, monogenic disorders and haematology. Also molecular pathology really has expanded over the last 10 years and we specialise in solid tumour EQAs. We have technical next generation sequencing EQAs we also perform assessments for our clinical colleagues in clinical genetics and genetic counselling. We have a whole suite of molecular newborn screening EQAs, as we do for PGT. Pharmacogenomics is one of our new um, areas of starting to develop into EQA here because that um, testing is starting to evolve. And today we're here to talk about our sample handling EQAs. So now to focus really on the sample handling EQAs, these came about linked quite a few years ago now, to the 100,000 Genomes Project that happened within the UK. So back in 2013, the, David Cameron, the then Prime Minister of the UK, announced the 100,000 Genomes Project and invested £300 million to sequence 100,000 genomes, mainly for rare disease and inherited disorders, but also for cancer and also for a small number of infectious diseases. Then we move on, please, Emma. Part of this, um, the NHS England um, came to GenQA and asked if there was a way that we could help ensure that the quality of the testing was of, of a high standard and that the whole genome sequencing within the programme was um, very much assured that because we were using a centralised whole genome sequencing service site, that samples would be moved across the system to the sequencer and we needed to ensure that the quality of these samples was sufficient for whole genome sequencing. So we were instrumental in helping to support the setting up of a network of 13 genomic medicine services and um, centres with centralised, as I say, whole genome sequencing and a centralised bioinformatics pipeline run through Genomics England. It required the standardisation of not just the sample and DNA extractions, but the sample handling up front as well. And that was to get the approval to provide samples for whole genome sequencing. So GenQA provided external quality assessment to determine the quality, the quantity and the quality control measurements of DNA extracted from blood and FFP tissue. So that's formalin fixed paraffin embedded solid tissue. So that's where the story started. And I'm now going to hand over to Fiona, my colleague, to tell you um, the updates on the EQAs and some of the really interesting results that have come out of these assessments. So thank you, Fiona. Thanks for the introduction, Sandy. So first of all, um, I wanted to explain a little bit about why we have the EQAs for sample handling and why they're so important. So many of the pre-analytical steps that are involved within genetic testing can have a big impact on the final clinical result. So it's really important to assess these where we can. And the sample handling EQAs help do that. They also allow laboratories to compare their extraction and quantification techniques and really look at the difference between the different methods and um, where they can improve on their uh, quality and quantity of DNA, having looked at laboratories that have extracted from the same samples. In addition, being able to accurately measure the quantity of DNA can save a lot of time and money for repeat testing or for requesting more sample. If samples with concentrations that fall outside their required cutoffs will, can result in rejections of samples or a failed test, which will result in delays. And in addition to this, good quality and quantity of the sample, which can be measured through this EQA, is really important for downstream testing, especially now as we look at further testing, such as along read sequencing. So just to give everybody a little bit of background about the EQAs that we have for sample handling, with the DNA extraction, we run four different types. For the DNA extraction from blood, we send out three samples of varying volumes. For the fresh frozen tissue, we'll send out two placental fresh tissue samples. And these have been cut up um, by a consultant histopathologist. 
and we also do the DNA extraction from formula and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And for this EQA, we'll be send, we send out three different samples from different sources, and these can be sent to participants either um, on slide mounted sections or rolled sections in tubes. And finally, we've got the DNA extraction from saliva. Unfortunately, this has been postponed for the last um, few years due to COVID-19 and the health and safety risks associated with handling the saliva. But for this EQA, we do send out three samples and these are from different donors. As well as the DNA extraction EQAs, we've also got the DNA quantification. So for this one, we send out six different samples of DNA and these come from a variety of different sources. And um, so in the past, we've looked at things like um, DNA from FFPE, from fresh tissue, from cells lines and from blood. And these are sent out at a variety of different concentrations. So just to give everybody a little bit of background in case you're not familiar of how the DNA extraction EQ is run. As Sandy had mentioned, these were originally set up for the 100,000 Genomes project, but they're now available to all of our GenQ participants. So in the diagram that we've got here, this example is looking at the DNA extraction from blood. So for this EQA, we would send out the blood sample along with um, return tubes. So prior to sending this out, we weigh the return tubes. When we send these out to participants, um, they'll then extract the DNA from the sample and send it back to us. We re-weigh this and this gives us the weight of DNA. And then along with our um, DNA concentration analysis, which is completed by DCPCR, we get the DNA quantity. And then we also look at the DNA quality. And the matrix that's used for this is dependent on the EQA. For our DNA extraction EQAs, we wanted to accurately determine the concentration to be able to give laboratories as much information as possible about their samples. For this, we looked into concentration analysis by DDPCR. So the advantage of this is we can determine the concentration without the need to generate standard curve. So just to run through quickly about how this works. So for the, each of the samples is partitioned into up to 20,000 different droplets. These each individual droplets are PCR amplified. And for this, we look at a reference sequence. Then each individual droplet is read and they is either called as PCR positive or PCR negative and then we can calculate the concentration based on this. So when we initially set up the DDPCR, um, we had asked the National Measurement Institute as a reference laboratory to measure some of the samples for the EQA. We're really pleased with the results, so we decided to um, start in-house measurements by DDPCR. So to do this, we completed verification and I just wanted to show some of the results that we got based on this. So this first top graph shows the results we um, completed with some of the samples that we, that we sent to the National Measurement Institute versus the results that we got in-house. And these results gave a correlation coefficient of 99.4%. In addition to this, we looked internally at a lot of different factors. So we completed um, DDPCR by different individuals on different days um, and run, ran them on the same plates and um, different plates to try and factor in as many variables as possible. And so the, the graph at the bottom just shows one example of the results that we achieved. And this was from two different individuals on different days. And we had a correlation coefficient of 99.6%. In addition to this, we also wanted to, to determine the limits of detection 
in the linearity. So to do this, we took four of the samples, which were the DNA sourced from blood, FFPE, fresh frozen tissue and saliva. We completed serial dilutions for each of those samples and ran them by DDPCR to determine the, the concentration and then compared these to the expected concentrations that we would receive based on the dilutions. The, the expected concentration and the concentration measured were shown to be highly high correlation with a correlation coefficient of 99% or 100%. The verification results that we received from the in-house testing and compared to the National Measurement Institute of Australia showed to be very consistent and so we were happy to proceed with using this in-house. So now I just wanted to go through some results that we got from the DNA extraction EQAs. So first of all we're looking at the DNA extraction from blood and this graph shows the, um, the mass of DNA that, that each of the laboratories have extracted from the three samples. So first in the blue, we've got the DNA extracted from one mil of blood. The orange is DNA extracted from three mils and the gray is the DNA extracted from 4.5 mils. And as we would expect to see, as the volume of blood that was supplied to the laboratories increases, the mass of DNA that the laboratories are able to extract also increases. This graph also highlights the variability in the um, mass that laboratories are able to extract. Although we do see the general trend that as the volume increases, the DNA mass increases. There are a couple of exceptions. And for this EQA, I'll go through a couple of those. So first of all, we have these two laboratories here. So both of these laboratories um, have extracted approximately the same mass of DNA for each of the samples. When we looked into this further, um, the laboratories used the same method for each sample and they produced the same volume of sample of DNA for each of the, the blood samples. So for these, we can possibly say that um, they've possibly extracted more DNA, but they've only sent the, um, the same amount for each sample. And then the next example we've got here. So for this laboratory, um, it looks like they've, for the three mil sample, um, there, there's been a drop between the one mil and the three mil sample, which we wouldn't expect. So for this, when I looked into this one further, um, they used a different method for each of the samples a different extraction method and um, so it's possible that the three mil sample and um, the extraction method within their laboratory was wasn't producing as much dna and then similarly we have this this lab here in which the the one mil and the three mil show to be increasing but they've not extracted as much for the 4.5 mil sample. And again, similarly to the previous laboratory, they used a different method for the 4.5 mil compared to the one in three mil. So this is possibly why we're seeing this trend. So if we just break this down further, I've created these three different graphs for the three different samples. So we've got from the one mil sample, the three mil sample and the 4.5 mil sample. And each of the, the bars is color coded based on the extraction method that the laboratories have used. And so these graphs highlight 
the real variability in the mass of DNA that laboratories are able to extract from the same original sample. It's also highlighting the variety of methods that are used. So in this AQA, a total of 15 different methods were used. And even within these methods groupings, there were, there were a variety of kits. And in addition to this, it demonstrates that um, the variability of laboratories using the same method and um, how many other factors are playing a role in the DNA extraction process. And finally, for the DNA extraction from blood, I just wanted to show a comparison of the mean mass of DNA that's extracted across the years. And so for this, I've only looked at um, 2020 to 2022. And these are the years in which we began using the DDPCR or the DNA concentration methods. And we can see that there is a trend of an increase in mass that laboratories are extracting. However, it's difficult to compare these and determine whether this is due to improvements in, as we have a variation in their participation year to year. And next, we'll move on to the DNA extraction from fresh frozen tissue. So as we had previously, this is the um, laboratories down on the x-axis and the mass of DNA that the laboratories are, were able to extract on the y-axis. And each of the labels highlights the um, freezing method and the extraction method here. So one thing to note with this is um, in our distribution letter, we do ask laboratories to snap freeze the tissue um, once it's received within their laboratory. However, from the information that we've collected, the variety of um, freezing methods, many of them aren't snap freezing and are just putting them into either minus 20 or minus 80 freezers. And this graph also shows the, the variability in the mass that laboratories are extracting. So for these samples, the, the range is from 2.68 micrograms to 161. When we look at the comparison of the mean mass of DNA extracted from fresh frozen tissue, we find that there's it's more variable and um, one thing that we need to consider here is as well as the participation varying from year to year, we also have to factor in that there may be um, variability in the cellularity of the tissue from year to year. So when for this EQA, we have a consultant histopathologist that completes the cut up to try and ensure each participant receives tissue of similar cellularity. However, we cannot control for this year to year. So there may be some variability. For the DNA extraction from FF, I also wanted to highlight the quality matrix here. So for the quality matrix, we use the tape station. And um, for the genomic screen tape, um, a software algorithm is used. And that determines and gives a numerical value to the integrity of the DNA, and that's referred to as a DIN, with, the, with a DIN of zero being highly degraded and 10 being highly intact. So from these graphs, you can see that the integrity um, of DNA year on year is fairly high for this EQA. So this highlights um, one, that we are getting quite good quality DNA, and two, that this is consistent year on year. And this really highlights why um, clinical laboratories tend to use this fresh tissue for testing such as whole genome sequencing rather than opting for FFPE.
Now moving on to the DNA extraction from FFPE EQA. So on the 2021 EQA, you can see here that we've got the um, a graph on the x-axis. We've got the laboratories that participated and on the y-axis, the mass of DNA that was extracted. With each of the different samples in blue, orange and grey. And this graph really highlights the, the variability in the mass that is extracted by different laboratories and also for the different sample types. So again, I've just broken this down further to look at each of the samples individually and highlighted each of the bars a different colour for the different extraction techniques that the laboratories used. So again, we can highlight the, the range in the constant in the mass that laboratories are able to extract. And I also wanted to just highlight that even though there is um, variability in the total mass that laboratories can are able to extract from the samples, the, the laboratories tend to be extracting proportionately the same amount. So we've got three examples here. This is um, one lab in the grey and they're um, consistently um, quite low in the extracted mass. And then this blue, which highlights the same laboratory in each of the graphs, which are roughly extracting around about the mean. So even though the means of the different samples are very different. This laboratory is extracting proportionately the, the, the same compared to the other laboratories. And then in the black arrow here, which is highlighting the same lab, which is consistently extracting quite a high mass of DNA for each of the samples. And finally, we'll move on to the DNA quantification EQAs. So again, this EQA was initially set up for the 100,000 Genomes project, but it's now available to all of our GenQA participants. And the format for this EQA is that we will send out the DNA samples to the laboratories. They'll be asked to measure the concentration and report it back to GenQA. And then we use this to benchmark them against all other participating laboratories. So when we're looking to analyse these results, we wanted to ensure that we were doing this in the fairest possible way and to use the correct statistical analysis. So for this, we um, consulted with a chartered statistician who helped come up with um, a statistical model that would be run for each of the samples. So in summary, um, the first thing that's done is the, the removal of outliers. The, um, the software then looks at the data and determines the best fit for um, which model to be used using AIC. Next, um, it will complete some bootstrapping. So this just helps to um, better estimate of the parameters of the distribution. And finally, it calculates the percentiles of the distribution. And that's done in an analogous way to using the mean and standard deviation for a normal distribution. So I just wanted to run through some examples of um, the EQA cases that we've provided previously. So the first one here is a DNA Q from 2021, and this was a fresh tissue sample. So based on the um, statistics that was run, we've got any laboratories that are between the two green bars here. These are all within 68 percentile of the mean. And then between the green and the yellow, is within 95 percentile and then the yellow to the black here is within the 99th percentile 
And so for these graphs, um, these are separated by the method grouping. So we've got the fluorometric um, methods, one laboratory that used qPCR, and then the spectrophotometric methods. So the, the, the results are, you can see, are quite variable across the different um, methods that are used to quantify the DNA. And then this next example is uh, from the same EQA year. And this time we're looking at the um, a sample from that's sourced from FFPE. So again, we've got the um, fluorometric um, methods that were used and the concentrations that laboratories reported, the qPCR and the spectrophotometric. So from this example here, um, you, we can see the, the variability and the tendency for the fluorometric ones to be um, on the lower end and the spectrophotometric um, reporting higher concentrations there. Within the 2021 EQA, we provided two samples, 144Q and 147Q. And both of these samples were from the same original DNA sample. However, one sample, 147Q, was diluted to half the concentration of 144. So from this, we were looking, we were expecting to see the concentrations reported um, as 147Q is half the concentration of 144Q. So in the graph here, it detailed each of the samples and each of the laboratories grouped. So one thing to highlight is this laboratory here, which seems to have um, measured a, a very, very high concentration for 147Q. When we looked into this a bit further, um, we noticed that the 144Q was reported at approximately 33 nanograms per microliter, and 147Q was at 142 nanograms per microliter. So it appears that possibly there, there's been a typo when they've been entering the results, and this sample here should have been 14.2. So to demonstrate this in a slightly different way, um, we would expect that the 147Q is 50% of the concentration measured for 144Q. So um, we calculated the percentage difference and took away 50. Um, so then this graph is then showing the labs that are closer to zero, so around here were closer to accurately demonstrating the difference between these two samples. And as we move further to the left, this is where the concentration of 147Q is increasing compared to the 144Q. And when we're moving to the right, this is where there's a greater difference in concentration between those two samples. And for this graph, I've highlighted the um, quantification method grouping by the colours indicated at the bottom. So the final example that I wanted to show was a sample that was sent out for the DNA quantification 2022 EQA. So for this sample, we'd stated in the distribution letter it was DNA extracted from FFPE. However, the sample was TE buffer and contained no DNA. So we were expecting laboratories to be reporting it as zero. So within this graph, again, it's been um, grouped by the method grouping for each of the um, laboratories. So some laboratories chose to use the fluorometric and spectrophotometric technique for this sample. And 
for these samples where there's no bar, laboratories either reported that um, there was no DNA in the sample or that it was below their limits of detection for the assay. And this sample highlighted that there are possibly some methods that are picking up and reporting DNA where there actually isn't any. From the examples that I've shared and generally across the um, DNA extraction EQAs, we do have some general observations. Um, one of the big observations that we find and the, um, is the variability in the mass that, um, of DNA that laboratories are able to extract. And this seems to be um, across different methods and between different laboratories. Another general observation is that the quality of the, the DNA, um, specifically for the DNA extraction from fresh frozen tissue, does seem to be very high and it seems to be remaining consistent across the years. And finally, for the DNA extraction EQAs, um, we do find that for the DNA extraction from FFPE, although there's variability in the mass that can be extracted from the different samples, there does seem to be consistency within laboratories um, with lo those laboratories um, extracting um, proportionately a proportionate amount of DNA compared to um, other participating labs. And the final observation for the DNA quantification EQA is that we do find that the spectrophotometric techniques measure um, the total amount of nucleic acids present. And through the EQA, the examples that we've provided here and um, more generally in the EQA, they do appear to be overestimating the DNA concentration. So moving forward, um, we are looking to make some updates with the EQAs. So following on from our participant survey and some general feedback for the DNA extraction from fresh frozen tissue, um, many labs have stated that um, they do extract fresh and don't snap freeze. So we will, we will be given the option for laboratories to extract from fresh from this EQA year onwards. And we're also very happy to announce that we'll be resuming the DNA extraction from saliva EQA um, for 2023. In addition, we're also looking to expand some of our sample handling EQAs. So we're scoping out the an RNA extraction EQA and also DNA extraction from lung retookancing and CTDNA EQA. So finally, just some acknowledgements. Um, we'd like to thank NHS England for the funding for the provision of the EQAs for the 100,000 Genomes Project, our sample handling specialist advisory group, who are instrumental in helping run and um, advise on all of our EQAs, our reference laboratories who help with the measuring the samples, NMI Australia who help with our verification of DDPCR. Great, thank you very much Fiona for a very interesting and educational presentation, that was great, thank you. Um, Emma, do you want to just move the slide deck on please? We've now got some, um, an opportunity for some live Q&A, so questions and answers. So if you're lucky, don't mind, there's a couple coming in fast and furious. Um, I've got one here um, saying you talked about assessing the quality of different DNA from different sample types. So how do you assess the quality for um, DNA extracted from FFPE tissue? And is that different? Because we know FFPE tissue, you know, degrades DNA, et cetera. How do we do that? Yeah, so for that EQA, what we do is we send it and libraries get prepared of the samples and we want to assess their um, suitability for 
NGS. So that's why we do the library pools. And then tape stations run these produced traces, which are then assessed by our um, expert advisors. OK, thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, somebody else is also querying um, about the saliva EQA, because I know you said that it was delayed due to COVID. So um, I think you said we're going ahead with it again. Do you want to just clarify the saliva EQA details? Yes. So, yep. So we've done some risk assessments internally about the, the safety of that. And also from feedback, we completed a, a a survey that was sent out to the participants and they are now more routinely um, extracting from saliva. So would the EQA would be beneficial for those. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. That's helpful. So I guess if anyone wants to participate in that, aren't registered for that run to, to get in touch or just get onto the website and they'll be able to do that one thing. It's open just now. Is that right, Fiona? It's open just now and it will be um, distributed in November. Perfect. Thank you for that. OK, a few more questions. Um, hi there, I may have missed this, but did you discuss regarding DNA extraction from venous blood? So we, we detailed the, was the results for, for that um, earlier in the presentation. Um, so you will be sent out the, the link for the recording so you can review that there. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's one of the EQAs that's expanding. I mean, there's a big demand now, isn't there, for people to benchmark the gene extraction for blood. So, um, yeah, please, please do get in touch. Uh, another question. Um, we often do experience different concentration of DNA for a given sample when we use a spectrophotometric based or fluorometric based measurements. So which one to trust, for example, for sequencing application? I think that's what we observed through the EQA as well. So it's quite nice to see it's happening in the real world, in the real life, in the labs. So which one would you recommend, Fiona? <laughs> so I think it sometimes it's variable. Generally, we find with FFPE, um, fluorometric um, methods tend to be a bit more reliable generally because the spectrophotometric tend to pick up some contaminants and from the EQ, EQA we've observed it sometimes overestimates but um, for other sample types I think the DNA quantification EQA really helps for labs to be able to see if their methods are generally overestimating or underestimating compared to other laboratories and then look at how this influences their results and um, whether they get it, they're receiving failures for their um, testing. Great, thank you Fiona for that. Um, another couple of questions coming in. So with the updates to ISO 15189, um, will you review the frequency of the exercises with distributions several times a year instead of a yearly release? Well, I think that's something that we would have to go out and speak to our participants about, see if there's a demand. Um, I know that um, some of them don't want more EQA. There's a huge amount of EQA goes on throughout the year. Um, but I think, yes, we need to get that fine balance between demonstrating the, um, the, the quality of the laboratory, but also against um, adding extra workload to already very, very busy clinical labs. But it is something that we will, we will take back and, and discuss internally. So um, a few more here, Fiona. Um, when will the CFDNA extraction scheme become available do you think will I take that one I think, it's yeah, I think so. something that's going to be technically difficult to deliver so we are currently speaking to some reference material companies to see how they can support us to do this it's obviously something that's in their best interest as well to develop that type of material and how we can handle it and um, the stability of the samples uh, so it's something that we are definitely scoping out. I don't think it will be in 2023. It will probably be in 2024. Do you think that's fair to say, Fiona? Yeah, I would agree, Fandy. Um, and a couple more. So a great talk. I presume these results are for human DNA. Have you got any panels for monitoring microbe extraction from blood and FFP samples where human DNA is a problem? So that's probably something. So we are very much a human genomics 
external quality assessment provider. We do have colleagues within the other UK NEQAS centres that specialise in microbiology and virology and other um, organisms. So it's something that we could take back to them to see um, if that's something that they would be able to um, provide. So maybe, um, Lily, if you could just drop us an email um, with your contact details and we can see if we can link you up with one of our colleagues in a different UK NECAS centre. So one final question, Fiona. Are there a correlation between the high yield and the quality of the DNA being extracted? So is there a compromise like quality versus quantity with regards to the integrity or other metrics? Now, this is something we discuss quite frequently with our scientific advisory group, isn't there? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and concept. And I would say that it's very variable <laughs> as with a lot of these things. Um, so some sometimes we do find that labs can extract um, a lot of DNA, but it's very poor quality or high quality, but a low quantity or both high, high quality and quantity. So it, it's really um, very variable and it depends on the laboratories that are um, completing the extraction and their protocols. Would you agree, Sandy, or do you have anything further to add? I, I, you're spot on. And I think the observation that we all come away with when we're looking at the data is even though labs are using the same extraction methods, the amount of DNA and the quality varies significantly. And I think we're always so surprised at how much tweaking or adaption of the methodology um, ha must happen locally for those differences to be so uh, apparent. Um, I think we've talked also about it might be interesting to see how different individuals following the same protocol in the same laboratory may get different out yields from their extractions as well. So I think there's so many multiple factors in there that contribute to the quality of the DNA. Um, it's quite, quite challenging. Yeah. yeah, and but I think one thing that the EQE does is obviously we provide our individual reports and each um, sample is scored for quality and quality matrix. So labs get a really detailed information about um, where improvements need to be made on these different aspects as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one final question, Fiona, which leads on from this um, is regarding the last question about quality quantity and quality of DNA, is there a drive to set any standards or international or national standards based on the most effective techniques? So I think I can take that one. I think as an EQA provider, we have to be independent. We cannot endorse any particular assay, methodology, techniques, manufacturer, um, both to recommend or discourage the use of both ways. What we try to do with these EQAs is very much demonstrate the variability and then up to and it's really up to them the laboratories to start acting about whether or not their extractions are sufficient for the service that they deliver. Um, I think if there's a need out there for the community, we'd be very happy to host workshop around um, the best optimal way of extraction, um, especially from samples where there's a very limited supply, you know, small child baby samples, blood samples, etc. Um, so I think if there's a need out there, then please do get in touch. It's something that we could support going forward. But at the moment, we're not planning to um, produce any standards of um, what should be done and how it should be done. I think that's that's quite a challenge to do. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, everyone, for all your questions coming in. Fiona, thank you very much indeed for all your hard work and the great EQA and presentations um, today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Sandy.